Hi, folks. My name is Jerry Wilkins. I play the bass, and this is Talking Blues. We have never really had a conversation. I don't. No, think. we have never. No. I just I'm thrilled that you're doing this, and and I just I need to correct out correct that fact that I haven't talked to you. So I, I want to get to know you a little bit. So let's begin. At the beginning, how did how did music come into your life? Well, I came from a fairly musical family, but never professionals. Although my dad, who played the piano by ear and was a very good singer, while he was in the midst of having five kids, he used to go to his what's Australia. I, I grew up in Australia, right? Did you know that? Yes, yeah, Sydney, right? Okay, yes, yeah, Sydney. So. The equivalent of the veterans, like the the Legion, right? And they always had a piano there. And my father could not walk past a piano. He did not have the ability to walk past a piano without playing it. He wasn't a great piano player, but he had a great feel and he got by. And he also was a good singer. And at one point, uh, an agent came to him who heard him play the piano and sing and had seen everybody around him. Hey, Charlie, you know. And he said, dude, you get a rhythm section? And this would have been in the 50s. Get a rhythm section, bass and drums. I'll have you working next week. And my wow. father was born at the end of World War One, grew up in the Depression, fought in the war, and then raised a family of five kids in suburbia. And in that world, people were not innate risk takers. People were safe because things were so insecure. And he passed. And my mother told me, he was never the same after that. Like he felt like, and I really wish he'd done it. So I was around music. My mother was conservatory trained, grade seven. She could read fly shit on paper. Have you ever heard that term before? <laughs> no. That's a term for somebody who's really good at reading music, right? Because, you know, the, all the little dots So. Man, that, that dude, he can read fly shit on paper. <laughs> so she was educated, but could only play if there was music in front of him. So my parents represented the two ends of music. My father was self-taught. He had not a fucking clue what he was doing. But he loved Louis Armstrong, and he loved Fats Waller, and he loved Duke Ellington, and he loved Count Basie, and he loved Benny Goodman. And I think that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. So I was around music. When I was about five, my two older sisters, one two years older, one five years older, we had to do the dishes every night. So we sang when we did the dishes. And we sang in harmony. And because I was the little brother, I was never allowed to sing the melody. So from five years of age, I was singing harmonies. Around the same time, there was a very popular artist in Australia in the 50s who was from Tunapuna in Trinidad. And her name is Winifred Atwell. And she was a round black woman with a giant smile and she was huge in Australia and she was huge in England, but never really took off in the States. And she played boogie woogie piano and she was killer. So somehow the Australian music scene, which was pretty milk toast, you know, <laughs> April love, really corny shit there was this thread of this 
very happy black woman playing the fuck out of boogie woogie music. <laughs> so in spite of the fact that my mother could only play on paper, at my insistence, she kind of learned to play a passable version of boogie woogie. And I used to say, mom, play boogie woogie. So she'd sit down and she'd start playing boogie woogie. And I'd always reach over and I would grab her right hand to stop her from playing because all I really wanted to hear was <laughs> it was born I was born to be a bass player now in the world of bass players I'm no great chops guy right but I really feel it and I understand the job so I ain't fancy but I'm functional but I thought you played guitar initially did you not only for a brief time. Okay. And I, so, and uh, well, like as we're telling stories, I got a million of them. I was in a band in Sydney and we used to play on a, on a play in a place called Taylor Square. And Taylor Square was where gay people and the hippies and the down and outs were. And you know, this would have been about 1966. How old would you have been? 19, okay. 18. I was in my, in fact, in my last three months to be a high school teacher. I was about to graduate in three months. But I'd already started playing in bands. And what did we play? Blues and jug band music. T tell me the blues that you were playing. What what would you have played at that point? Muddy Wolf, uh, the, pretty much a strong chess contingent. Can I ask at that point, would you have had any access being in Sydney, Australia, to seeing any of the blues artists? They, you know what we we the band I was in, we left in January seventy one, and in nineteen seventy two, Muddy and the band went there. Oh, that really? was the first time. And the funny thing is, in about 1995, I was playing with uh, Jackson Delta at the Ottawa Jazz Festival. And their special guest was Pine Top Perkins. And he was on that tour. So first off, we were playing blues and I was playing upright bass. Well, he loved that because most everyone playing blues in those days was playing more of a rock and right. blues stuff. Then he found out I was an Aussie and he really freaked out because they were treated like gods there. So for us, the only thing we could do was listen to records, which we did a lot of. And people, hey, and once we got a, we once we wrote a letter, a group letter to Hal and Wolf, and he wrote back. That was a really awesome, right? So I was in a band called, oh no, I'm about, I'm, I'm starting to play in bands, 1966, and I'm about to graduate as a high school teacher. I did acid, and I went, fuck this. I don't want to be a school teacher. I want to be a musician so i went to the dean i say i'm out i want i want out and he looks at me like uh listen dude three months time you're gonna graduate and you're gonna have that to fall back on for the rest of your life and i said nah i'm out thanks to check you later and i learned one of the most important things about being a professional musician, which is having nothing to fall back on. It's a high motivator. You play I, I, or you die. I wonder what, I mean, you were obviously playing already, but did you have any idea or any sense of what being that full-time musician, what that was about, what, what, what kind of living you would make or what kind of... Where you hope to I land? Think I, I think I intuitively knew that getting into it for the money might be folly. 
No, I was hooked on playing. And so I started playing guitar, not very well. As a matter of fact, badly. In fact, I didn't really know shit. I was just, because I started a little later than most people, like 16, I was. And why did you start playing guitar? Because how else do you get girls? Not, not with the bass? Well, I didn't know shit about bass. I mean, other than that, I liked it. You know what I mean? I, I had a consciousness of it. But at that point, the entry level pretty much is always guitar for people because it's portable. It's, you know what I mean? I didn't, I knew one band, kids in the neighborhood, a little, a little bit older than me, uh, a year or two older than me. And I'm f still in touch with the, the bass player. Wow. Kevin Curry. And, uh, no, I just wanted to learn to play the guitar. I wanted to learn to play music. So I I don't know how I got the money, but I got an acoustic guitar, and then I went to some places where people played together, like coffee houses and jam spaces and that, and ended up connecting with the blues scene. And then I got an electric guitar, which was really bad, and an amp that was really dodgy and join a band called the starving wild dogs. <laughs> we were kind of sort of a bit like if the Rolling Stones were playing jug band music. Well, the repertoire was blues and really old jug band shit like Mississippi Sheiks and Memphis Jug Band and Clarence Williams and all this astounding stuff. We had a piano player and I played guitar and there was a drummer and a bass player who was, who didn't last very long. He was really good. And a singer who played harmonica, an asthmatic harmonica player. And they called him Wheezing Walter T. Mud. <laughs> and and that scene was big on you know nicknames and blues names and that thing we we were living the fucking you know and we I don't know we lived on air I don't know how we survived or <laughs> paid rent or ate I can't even recall so we used to play at the Oxford Hotel on Wednesday nights and Saturday nights and we were quite successful Part of our success, or at least our crowd size, was based on we were adopted by the Sydney chapter of the Hells Angels. That was had an interesting aspect to it. So we played for a bunch of time, and I realized, you know what? I'm not even at their level, and I don't know what I'm doing. I, this is foolishness. What I should do is go get a job, buy a good guitar, take some lessons, buy a good amp, come back to it. So, Wednesday night, I say to the boys, boys, I'm out. Come Saturday, my last night, I'm going to get a job. So we plan on Wednesday night. And up walks the doctor's son, a nice Jewish boy who owned a Les Paul on a and a twin and had all the lessons in the world and he could play the guitar like the bejesus so he comes up to the stage he says hey can i sit in and i'm thinking you know this is my second last night with a band and i'm about to get humiliated by this guy who can play rings around me because i'm kind of hopeless so we had a really good drummer really great drummer so we had a temporary bass player and I I'm gloomily leave the stage. And as I'm stepping off the stage, I turn around, I look at this bass player, and for God knows why, in my 18-year-old Aussie accent, and said, uh, can I have a go on your bass? <laughs> he said, sure, he gave me his bass. 
we play two songs. The drummer takes his stick and he points at me and he says, you're the bass player. That's it. How did you know what to do on the bass? Had you, had you played the bass at all? No, I never played the bass. Interestingly enough, there was a legendary harmonica player who died from amphetamine poisoning. But he was a fantastic harmonica player and singer. His name was Shane Duckham. And he put together a real Chicago blues band. And I was hired. This didn't last very long. I was hired as the second guitar player. Now, the role of a second guitar player is very often to double the bass lines. Or at least that. And so they had another guitar player who was a killer blues player and a great rhythm player. And most of the time, I'm just tracking the bass lines. So I kind of know two form basic lines. But they are, you know, which is to walk, ba-doom, doom, doom. And the other one is doom, ba-doom, doom, doom, doom. Between that and that, it's sort of everything is somewhere in between those two. And I have no idea how I did it. When the drummer pointed to you and said, you're the bass player, did you have a sense that you, you were working out well as a bass player? I, it was so much fun. And to make the very first time he ever played the bass with a really good drummer, so straight away, yeah, you step in the step, you know, you walk in the walk with the, a real dude. And when he said that, for some reason, I never doubted it for a second. I've had quite a few instant realizations in my life where I didn't even think about it, like quitting teacher's college. Yeah. I just didn't want to be there anymore. I wanted to go play music. And here I am, year 56. And I'm really starting to get the hang of it. Tell me about that connection with the drummer. Can you... Can you I exp- didn't even understand it because I didn't know anything about what a rhythm section really did. 56 years later, if I was to ask you what makes a good rhythm section, how would you explain that to me? Well, that's a tricky question because you've probably heard people in their praise of a rhythm section saying, oh man, those dudes are so tight. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. You've heard this? Yes. So that makes the gold standard for a rhythm section. Who's the tightest? Right? Mm -hmm. So, as I went along in my career, that became more and more popular as clarity of recording got better and they started close miking each drum. All of a sudden, drums were like way more loud than they used to be. So, you know, say, let's say Rough Trade or even even David Wilcox, although less so. Rough Trade and bands like that. Bucky and I were famously tight. This is Bucky Berger. Yeah. But can you also, just, just to clarify, can you tell me in your mind what tightness is between you and the drummer? Is it? Let me tell basic- you this. Okay. Because I'm getting to that. It's just a little circuitous. But what the heck? We're not running tape. <laughs> <laughs> Let's backtrack again. Sure. The release of the music from the Big Pink. I was a kid playing music in Australia, in Sydney. And music from the Big Pink blew people's minds. Let's not forget George Harrison did say that the band was the greatest band in the universe. Did you know that? I know a few people have said it. I wasn't sure about it. Yeah. 
George Harrison said that. So anyway, when I was first listening to them, I did not really know Dick Hall. But at one point, through it all, because everything was great, the songs were great, the singing was great, the sounds were great. And then at one point, I started listening to Leave On. Back then, I didn't even understand it, but there was something he was, oh, he was reaching really deep inside of me. And I said to myself, wow, I bet you it would be really amazing to play with Levon Hill. But the odds of that ever happening were zero to none. 45 years later, I played 13 gigs with Levon. Now, the thing about Levon is Levon De Helm and Rick Denko, bass and drums from the band. When everyone else was striving to be, as we used to say, tighter than a gnat's ass on a rain barrel. That's what we used to say. That was the highest compliment you could pay to a rhythm section. Somehow, Levon and Rick were on this whole other scene. They were loopy as hell and they never played together. But they played the song beautifully. So even though they weren't looking for the, this tightness, the fact that they were both so focused on the songness and they were both major singers, so their connection to the core of the song, which is, of course, the melody and the lyrics, they were together, but not tight. They weren't tight at all. And I was, through the tight period, I was always kind of fascinated by, like, but what about those guys? They're not tight. How come they can be not tight? So, by the time I joined Big Sugar, which was with Al Cross, I made a conscious decision to dump the tightness factor. And I also realized if you're in a trio, you got three people. If the bass drum and the bass are playing the same rhythm all the time, then you're wasting a guy. <laughs> because if he's playing pattern A on the bass drum and I'm playing pattern B on the bass, but they intertwine and overloop and create a feel and a rhythm that actually neither are actually playing. Do you understand that? Yeah, yeah. All right. I mean, I don't know. Is that too technical? No, no. But I, I'm just I'm curious in your words how you see things like working with a drummer like and you've worked with some great ones like Al Cross and like Bucky Berger um, um, and David Adorenza last uh, night right so Genius. is it something that you as soon as you start playing you lock into and go we're tight or is this something you really have to work at all right all right so okay I have all these tricks I know this guy you know Joe Blow he's playing the drums tonight and I know he comes from the tight school. So I know whatever rhythms I lay down, he's going to lock into. So I have this trick I do, which is there's a pattern that I want to play, and there's a pattern that I would really love if he was playing, but I'm not about to give him instructions because I don't really know him and it's not my place. Right. Right. We're just on a gig together. So the pattern that I want him to play, I start to play a bass line that is based on that pattern because I know very, you know, within two bars or four bars, this guy's going to hear my line and he's going to go, hey, what's this? I can be tight. I'm going to lock right into your bass line. So he does that. Now, He's locked right in where tight as can be. And I'll stay there 
until I hear him breathe out, which means we've established the groove. So now I don't have to, I'm not looking. The drummer's not looking. What? Oh, what should I do? He's locked into my part and everything is good. I feel his tension go away. I know he's set. Then I change my pattern to what I wanted to play, which is not what he's playing. And chances are, unless he's too attentive, which not a lot of musicians are, he's going to continue to play that pattern and I'm going to be as happy as a clam. Last night, the young boy I was playing with, Andrew McCarthy, he's 31 years, 33 years of age. He's from Newfoundland, and he's a, we played together quite a bit. I play with a lot of young musicians over the years, and we have a very good relationship. And last night, I was just overjoyed with the listening to what I'm playing and what his bass drum is doing, and they're completely unrelated, but it's totally perfect. Um, I was told that you have a reputation of... <laughs> me- <laughs> of, well, of I, can't, I can't wait for this. <laughs> no, 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 this is a good thing. <laughs> of, of, of mentoring young musicians. Well, in fact, that's a totally accidentally... I think uh, it started when... A very weird start. I was in David Wilcox and the Teddy Bears. Bucky, me, David Baxter, do you know him? I know the name, yes, yeah. And Wilcox. What year? 76. Okay. I joined the 13th of July, 1976. It was my redemption. Because for my beginnings of playing jug band music and blues, one of those bands I was in went out of town to play at a festival opening for a band that had two hit records in the top 10 right that time. And they were like a country rock band, sort of like the birds, 12 string guitar, harmony vocals. So my band, this funky ass bluesy band, we play out concert and we come off stage and the leader of the of the headliners, he comes up and he goes, our bass player is sick. Can you come and play with us? <laughs> okay, what are you going to play? <laughs> so I had 20 minutes to learn 45 minutes worth of songs and I did the best I could. And two days later, they asked me to join their band. So I was instantly a rock star. I would never have gotten out of Australia without that because in the scene where I was home, my blues scene, Taylor Square, there was a lot of heroin and people were dying and it was really great, but it was pretty gritty. So it was at the Flying Circus? So what was yes. that? About? Okay, so, so that's the band that basically... That got me out of Australia because they had a thing called the Battle of the Bands, which when they first started, all the pro bands like, oh, fuck that. I don't want to be, what is this, a contest? And and the prize was, I can't remember, five hours in a studio and some guitar amplifiers. And then they were mostly shitty bands that went into the contest. So one year chocolate company that sponsored it made the prize a sea trip a sea voyage to london england well it had already been gone for a couple of years and all the pros had been disdainful of it so oh well well, yeah sure okay nobody went in it except at the last minute one of the big bands went in and of course zoom they swooped it one, now they're in London, England on a free trip. The next year, every pro brand in the country went in the contest. The year after that, Flying Circus won it. It was 1970. We left, uh, except the trip, the prize was a trip to Los Angeles. Well, when I joined the band, they were kind of squeaky clean. 
but I was a blues pothead. <laughs> I fucked those guys up really good. And pretty soon they were like raging hippies. <laughs> playing great music. And we decided, we left Sydney, Australia in January 1971 on a ship called the Arcadia. And I live in a building called Arcadia. Coincidence. So. Wait, wait, can I ask you? Before this contest happened, and I think the Flying Circus was doing quite well as a yes, professional it was. band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what would your goals been for the band? Or what would your personal goals have been? Any? More, more hit records. Could you have stayed in your, in Australia and gone to another level, or was it important that you had to leave? I think that we would have, no, we would have gone into a cycle. We would have gone into a loop where every second year we'd make an album and every first year we'd do a national tour and in between we'd blah, 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 whatever, you know just how it goes but we won that we won that contest and we nearly didn't go we nearly we nearly didn't go but an agent gave us a hard time and said you gotta go so we got as far as san francisco and we talked and we said los angeles full of phony people that's <laughs> Let's live in San Francisco. Now, all this time, we were in the middle of a negotiation with Capital US, an ongoing negotiation. So we're in San Francisco. We're jamming in our apartment. We're going to Fillmore West to see amazing bands, but we can't work because that deal isn't through, so we don't have papers. The year before, we had done some dates with McKenna Mendelssohn Mainline, who I loved the shit out of because they were sort of from the same stock that I came from, right. Jug Band Blues, right? <clears throat> so backstage in Melbourne, bass player comes out of the dressing room, bums the smoke off me, you shoot the shit. We assume they're Americans. They say, I like Americans. No, 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 we're from Toronto. Oh, I don't know shit about Toronto, except the name Toronto was always on our school textbooks because the company that made our school textbooks was based in London, Sydney, and Toronto, which always looked like Tonto and the Lone Ranger to me. And that was my total relationship with Toronto. And... Uh, he gave me a business card of an agency on Scullard Street in Yorkville. But, you know, the, we hadn't won any battle of the bands. We were an Aussie, Aussie band. What the fuck am I going to do with this? I gave it to our agent. In the meantime, we won the battle of the bands. In the meantime, we left Australia, and now we're living in San Francisco. And interestingly enough, considering what day it is. One of the memorable shows was going to see Fleetwood Mac with Christine Perfect playing piano. This is 1971. Um, I wrote this in my Facebook today. I don't know if you saw it, but um, it was John McVie and Mick Fleetwood, Christine Perfect. Do you know that's her name? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before she married John McVie, Denny Kerwin and Jeremy Spencer. So they were an English blues band and they were a pretty hardcore blues band and they were actually really good and she was really great. Funny story, Jeremy Spencer. Next night they were playing at the Whiskey A Go Go. Jeremy Spencer went out at five o'clock to buy a newspaper, never came back, joined the Children of God, didn't play music for 10 years. But that's another story. So we're in San Francisco killing time. This Aussie agent is in New York 
He's looking through his wallet and he finds this Toronto address. And he thinks, I wonder what the fuck goes on in Toronto. So he comes to Toronto. He goes to 80 Scarlet Street. It's called The Music Shop. And it's an agency and he finds out the bands, the drinking age is 21. The only bands that played gigs really were like R&B bands for older people. Because it was 21, the biggest thing you could get if you were under 21, the biggest entertainment you could get is every top line band used to play high school dances. And sometimes they did two, three, four a week and they paid good dough. So this agent goes, oh, uh. he calls us up in San Francisco. He says, why don't you wait in Toronto? Because I think because of the Commonwealth connection, maybe you can gig. They say, well, we're really pining to gig because we've been fucking workaholics, you know, like touring and constantly playing till four o'clock in the morning. So we got on a bus in San Francisco, went to Vancouver, got off the bus at 10 a.m. and at 4 p.m. we got on a Via Rail, spent three and a half days seeing two thirds of Canada. That was a trip. Well, tell me about that. Tell me as a young man who knew nothing about Toronto and probably very little about Canada, what that journey across Canada would have meant to you and what impressions it made on you. Okay, so it was March. And the first thing was the Rockies were mind-boggling. Because <laughs> they only have one big mountain in Australia, and that's where there's snow. There's one place in Australia where there's snow, Mount Kosciuszko. So seeing the Canadian Rockies was like, holy shit. But then, because there was snow on the ground, the next few days just seemed like one big white blanket <laughs> where you'd occasionally see a native person on a skidoo. And I remember in... And we were just in the, you know, sitting on seats. We were pretty broke. We bought bread and peanut butter. We couldn't afford to spend money on that. We met this kid who 40 years later I connected with as a professor at a university in Oshawa. Hmm. This 15-year-old kid is on the train too. He's got no money and he's got no food, but he's got a pot. So we fed him and he got us high. So it was a great trip. It was also the the daughter of the vice president of Standard Oil, who was a raging hippie rich girl, and she had peyote. So there was that too. <laughs> and there was a guy who had a fretless bass with a set of headphones. And I played about a hundred fucking hours of fretless bass and decided as soon as I get to Toronto I'm going to get a fretless bass and then I chickened out because it's harder <laughs> <laughs> you don't have the lines eh it's all here right that's what it is did you ever get one oh yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. another fantastically dramatic story too I, every, all my transitions were all pretty dramatic and quick and out of nowhere because, because you're so impulsive, or why Why would that be? Circumstances. But fortunately, I was not much of a ditherer. To this day, I swear to God, in my brain, I have two lights. And one's red, and one's green. I did a swing dance recently with Michael Johnson and Michael said he'd hired a drummer 
31, 31 year old East Indian drummer. And I know nothing about him, but Michael says, yeah, I had him on one of my gigs and he was great. So immediately a light goes on and it went on green. And I knew that we were going to be fabulous. And we played our first set together. We'd never even met before. It was truly fantastic. And at the end of the set, I walked over and shook his hand. And I said, see, that's what you get after playing together for 20 years. <laughs> Making a joke. Because honestly, we sounded like we'd been playing together for 20 years. And this band was, have you heard Charlotte? Trombone Charlotte? Mm -hmm. You heard her? No. Yep. So she was in the band. A really great gypsy jazz guitar player, a Japanese guy named Tack, and The Find. A few months ago, I did a gig with Trombone Charlotte at La Rev. And I uh, was going to be a trio. I said, who are we playing with? She said, oh, I've got a piano player. I said, okay. So I get to the gig at pro time, which is 30 minutes before the gig. She comes in five, she's the band leader. She comes in five minutes before the downbeat. In tow, she's got this child, this rosy-cheeked boy. I'm meeting Duncan. Yeah, I'm going to play the piano. Hey, dude, how old are you? He says, 19. The piano at La Rev is a very good piano. This kid sat down and we played jazz standards. Now, do you know who Red Garland is? No. Okay. Red Garland is a bop era, bebop era piano player who played with Coltrane. He played with Miles. He made his own records. The thing about him was, as you know, bebop was an explosion and people were going fucking nuts, including the piano players. Right. Somehow Red Garland was really creative and really simpatico, but he carried the whole history of all jazz music from when it was invented. His feel, his choice of he was different to the other kids. He was very good at the piano, but he wasn't blah, 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 right? We played the first set with this, me and Charlotte and this boy. And I'm like, holy shit. End of the set, he's at the bar eating soup. I go up, I say, you know Red Garland? He turns around with this huge smile. He goes, oh, I love Red Garland. So I have to go way up the line of great piano players before I find somebody who's better than this boy. Wow. He's extraordinary. So he was, that was the band, the East India drummer and Charlotte and the Japanese gypsy jazz player and the Aussie bass player and Michael Johnson, who is usually, have you ever been to the communist order on a Saturday? No. Boy, you know what? You have to do this. So have you ever been to the communist order at all? No. You know what it is? No, I don't. It's a Dundas and Ossington. Okay. It is formerly a tiny Portuguese cafe. It holds 29 people. We play there on Saturday afternoon from 4 p.m. till 7 p.m. And we've been playing there for 19 years. Wow. There's two gypsy jazz, it's all acoustic. Two gypsy jazz guitar players, the rhythm player and the Django guy. There's a young brilliant swinging hard violin player, me and upright place. And Michael Johnson, he's Gordy Johnson's young brother. So Michael 
sings, tells stories, plays the trumpet, and is the bartender simultaneously. Doesn't raise a sweat. He's never flustered. How chaotic it gets, right? It is, it's never been advertised. It's never been an ad for Saturday afternoon of the Communist Order. It is 99% of the time packed. People say they have never been to a show like this. So now we're playing with a different mixture of people, but still Michael and I. Now we're playing at the Redwood Theatre on Girard, which is now a venue. It was built in 1914 as a burlesque house. It has a lot of history for action, music. You can feel it. You can feel it in the wood, in the room, you know. So they've, they've turned it into a venue, and I think that it's got a lot of potential. So we played Friday, uh, last Friday, we played a swing dance. Now, there happened to be, unfortunately, two events. One was Raul at the Old Mill, and one was a big swing dance. I think it was at, but it doesn't matter. So there weren't that many swing dances. But the dining area was completely sold out. So it was not like it was a dud gig, but... And the band, like at the end of the first set, people are going, are you telling me that this band has never played together before? No. As a matter of fact, I only met some of the people today. And so people were blown away. It was a really good band. Now, Michael, without having to fucking pour drinks and keep tabs of whose bill is what, is a fantastic entertainer. And it was really fantastic. It was mind boggling. So if we go back to that, once you got off, once you got off that train and landed in Toronto, tell me what that was like. Well, we got picked up by our agent and two young guys with a van who became our roadies. One of the agents at that agency was a guy who's now a pretty famous international agent named, uh, uh, uh Wayne Thompson. Well, turns out Wayne Thompson's aunt owned a men's boarding house out on the Queensway by St. Joe's Hospital where they had suites and the people who lived there were mostly factory workers and they would be put into a four-bed a four bed suite with one bathroom and downstairs was a dining room and Rita, the auntie, she cooked for them. And I think she even did their laundry, if I'm not mistaken. So it's sort of like a boarding house. So Wayne says, let's put them in there. <laughs> so first we went and we lived in a men's boarding house at, on the Queensway. And we stayed for a few months and we realized we got our capital US deal. We realized that San Francisco or the States in general had a kind of an odd vibe about it that we didn't love. The day before we arrived in San Francisco at noon at a crossing an intersection in Haight-Ashbury where we lived, two cops were shot dead. Nobody saw a thing. Not a witness in sight, you know. And it was a black neighborhood with a lot of hippies in it. So it was pretty weird. So we decided, you know what? Maybe we'll stay in Toronto. So we had a return trip to Australia. And we decided to take the ocean liner back to Australia. 
and do a nine-week tour of the country, a farewell tour. I got married to an Aussie lady, and we came back here in September of 71, and I've been here ever since. How did that album do? You know, we had minor hits, and we were signed to do, I think, two more, and we did that. But that band was managed by Lighthouse. So we got a leg up by touring the States and all across Canada being Lighthouse's opening act. They didn't like their bass player. They booted him out, and I got the gig. But I really, really wanted to be in McKenna Mendelssohn Mainline. <laughs> because that was my bag. So the band I was in didn't play the music I played. But, you know, I was committed and I did the best I could with what we had going on. And I must say, I learned a lot about singing harmony and that was a good thing that served me well over the years. So I spent a while and a couple of years in a lighthouse. And then... What what did you learn from that experience? Because I would presume that would have been a level up from what you were used to. I learned that being a rock star ain't all it's cracked up to be. And that for me, if I don't love the music, I don't love the music. And I didn't love the music. There was some stuff was okay. I mean, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's the people that... Uh, for a lot of people, those songs, like One Fine Morning, uh, that's the story of their life. They were, you know, that was when they were teenagers getting dry humped in the back of the car, and that's their memory of it, right? But I it, I grew ang more and more anxious as it was going along, and then we did a grueling Cross Canada tour where we played 68 concerts in 75 days from... Victoria to St. John's, Newfoundland, on a bus. Wow. I nearly flipped out. <laughs> Part of that was when you're on a bus that long, you get constipated. Nothing will fuck your head up like being constipated. <laughs> right. So then Lighthouse ended. I mean, it's interesting that you would have, had, you would have played with a, a band as, as big as Lighthouse so early in your career. Just right place at right time, yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know if it's that, because obviously, I mean, if I don't if anything, think I was very good. I don't know why you would say that, because, you know, obviously... Well, the, you know the, what, all right, so when I joined that band in Australia, Flying Circus... Right. I had been playing bass for 18 months. I didn't know nothing. Now, that's... Wait. All right, all right, I shouldn't <laughs> say that. Wait a minute. <clears throat> I couldn't play, like, anything fancy at all. One thing that I was good at, and I still am good at, is from day one, I was good at playing a song. See, a lot of times you find, well, bass players, in this case, we're, saying, we're talking about bass, that a bass player sees a song as a framework that allows him to show people what he can do. Wait a minute, what about the singer? Oh, there's a singer? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Busy and, and <laughs> irrelevant and, right? Now, when it took, until I was 40 years of age, I was always embarrassed about my playing because all the bass players I knew had all these fancy licks, and I actually didn't have any licks at all. And when I got to be 40, I went, wait a minute, all those licks are just a huge pile of bullshit. And my skill is playing songs, and it's kept me already employed for 20 years. So in actual fact, I saved myself a huge amount of what is essentially useless effort in trying to be a hot shot. <laughs> okay, so but when you when you play with a band 
of Lighthouse's level and decide, well, this isn't really it for me. And and I presume you're playing to bigger audiences. Oh, yeah. And traveling, hopefully, in a, well, maybe not in a first class, but in a better... No, no, it was, you know, it was, you know, yeah, sure. So when, flew, when, mostly, you know. When you give that up, or when that's ended, what, how do you feel about things? Because you, you said you, you wanted to play with McKenna Mendelssohn. What, right. So, all right, so I was at Loose Ends. So, just before I left, before I joined Lighthouse, their singer Bob McBride had left. So the Lighthouse I was in, the drummer Skip Prokop was the lead singer or whatever. So I was looking to make my way back towards the music I like. And I even went to the Midwich Cuckoo. Did Were you around for that? No. I know of the place, but... Yeah, a, a basement joint on Java Street. And I went to see a band called the Rhythm Rockets. And the Rhythm Rockets had Morgan Davis in it and David Wilcox in it. And I met David Wilcox that night. And I was pretty impressed with them. And then I got a phone call from Lighthouse Management. They said, listen, we're putting a band together to back up Bob McBride. We have a bass player. But Dennis Penrith, but he's out on the road with Murray McLaughlin for six weeks, and we want to rehearse the band during that time. So we will pay you to be the rehearsal bass player. That's a real old school thing. Famous drummer, he's got a gig. They have a rehearsal. He sends in the rehearsal drummer. Some other guy. Oh, fuck, I, don't, I don't have time for that. Just make notes and let me know. You know, that's yeah, yeah. So that that's from the tradition. So they hired me as a rehearsal bass player. Over the period of the six weeks, the band was great, and I fell in love with the players. Bob was entering a drug addiction period. I was in the band for 10 months. He's the lead singer. It's called the Bob McBride Band. He missed 11 gigs in 10 months where he just didn't turn up. And we're in Guelph at a high school. And the vice principal comes, oh, uh, we just received a call from Bob McBride. Um, he was halfway here and he started to feel ill. So he had to turn around and go home. So you guys, we'll give you half the money. So we hacked together like whatever we could to play. Then that band got plucked by a New York producer named Jimmy Ina, who was the producer of Three Dog Night. Three Dog Night had reached the point where one of the guys was so fucked up that he had a nurse to travel with him, and she dressed him, and she fed him because he was so out of it, he couldn't look after himself. So maybe we need another band that's just like Three Dog Night. So this guy, he puts out to seven in Atlanta, Houston, Toronto. He reaches out to all these producers he knows. And he goes, I want you to put a band together with three front male singers I want you to record these five songs and four songs of your choice. So one of the, the contact Toronto was Skip broke up the leader of Lighthouse. So Lighthouse, so Skip takes Bob McBride's band and finds a guy who is a kind of a hard rock singer, another guy who's a jingle singer, and another guy who is a male model. 
and we had a band called Deja Vu. We rehearsed on salary 500 yards from where I'm sitting on King. King, just south of King and Bathurst. We rehearsed, this is uh, 1975. We rehearsed for six months learning songs. Skip was bringing in these songs. He had a buddy who was writing tunes. They were pop songs. But they were pretty awful. But the players were great and Sometimes you can think, oh, I could probably put up with this because everything else is cool. Our first gig was opening 21 dates across Canada for Joe Cocker. So the keyboard player woman, Trish Cullen, RIP, had written this piece called Unusual Vegetables. And it was a mega prog rock piece of music. So the band would play that and then the three singers would come out. Well, this Unusual Vegetables was so fucking dynamic and went all over the place, but it was very well done. If you like that kind of thing, we'd finish the first song. People would go nuts. Out would come the three singers, They'd do the first song and people would be like, what the fuck is this? So we limped along for a while. And I was really, really tiring of the attempt to be successful. The piano player from that band lived downstairs from me on Roxburgh. And his girlfriend was a big music fan. And in an uh, uh, early July 1976, she says, you got to go to the chimney, see this band. They're called David Wilcox and the Teddy Bears. You'll really like them. So, okay. So I go with my Aussie wife, who I met the same day I became a professional musician, the 3rd of June 1967. After that date, I did nothing but play music. Funnily enough, we got divorced, but I live in a co-op. She lives downstairs. My wife is a yoga teacher. My ex-wife is a student. My children treat my wife like their auntie. That's another story. So we go to see David Wilcox and the teddy bears. Blows my mind. To this day, I think David Wilcox is the greatest guitar player in Canada. Hands down. David is on a level people could only conceptualize. David can, what's the word? He takes the guitar inside of his being and the guitar becomes part of his mind. It's way beyond talent something else mm -hmm. david always had it he's a fucking genius musician and even though he went through all kind of insane periods of when he was a drunk and whatever which he hasn't been for 30 years i can tell you he's still the greatest guitar player so wednesday night chimney and i'm sitting with my wife leone and we're listening to david baxter Bucky Berger, David Wilcox, and a bass player from uh, from uh, Richmond Hill named Mike Love, who played with the Good Brothers. So two songs in, and I turn around to my wife, and I say, what the fuck am I doing wasting my time? Why aren't I playing this Roots music? This is... Two years before, I met Wilcox once. They finished the set. The dressing room was here. We were at a table by the passageway. So Wilcox is walking towards the dressing room. He gets up a few stairs to where we're sitting, and he looks at me. He goes, oh, hi, hey, how you doing? I was shocked that he would remember me, right? 
So the next day I had a gig in Hamilton with this awful band and we're all in a van all the way down. All I can talk about is how fucking amazing David Wilcox and the Daddy Bears were. Halfway back and on that trip in the van, all I could talk about was how great David was. So halfway back, somebody in the band says, hey, shut the fuck up about David Wilcox and the Daddy Bears. I went back the next night, Friday, to see him again. This time, I'm sitting right beside the stage. And I can see across the stage, the dressing room door, I see the band walk out. And Wilcox walks across the dance floor. But before he gets, walks up, step on the stage, he takes a little beeline and he comes to my table and he says, in his very formal way, as David is, so fantastically formal. He says, I wonder if you might come to the dressing room. I need to speak to you after this set. What the fuck is this? So they play a set. Again, he blows my mind. I go to the dressing room. He says, I'm having some problems with my bass player. And I was hoping you might come to my house next Monday and audition. I say, oh, yeah. Okay, so Monday I go to his house. We both plug into one amp, sitting on his living room floor. He says, okay, let's play a slow blues in A. We play two choruses of a slow blues. Takes his strat, he puts it on the ground. He goes, the starting pay is $187.50 and I'd like you to start next Monday. Well, in Ottawa. So, on Sunday, I played Nathan Phillips Square with that band. Again, the audience is like, wow, that, that's a great song. The first song. Now the singers come out, and then they all go like, what the <laughs> fuck is this? And it was horrible singing, too. They were all trying to outdo each other. So there was a lot of yelping going on. You know what I mean? Over yeah, singing, yeah. Oversouling, as they say. Next morning, Bucky, who I didn't know, comes to my house in his Mazda. We get in the, I put my amp in his car. We drive to Ottawa. We play at a joint called the Black Swan. In those days, we all played usually Monday to Saturday, and sometimes there'd be a matinee. So the way it went was this. Monday and Tuesday, pretty dead. Hip people only. Wednesday, could be either way. Thursday was usually pretty good. Friday and Saturday were always good. The matinee was hit and miss. Sometimes good, sometimes not good. That's how it went. And as long as that pattern was followed and you had those three big nights, everyone was happy. Everyone made their money. I got to play with David at the Black Swan in Ottawa. The fucking joint, Monday night. The joint is jammed. So pretty much, including the matinee, the fuck that we they had to do a matinee, including the matinee, and basically, everywhere I ever played with David, every night was pretty much jammed, and it was it 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 saved my soul because it was the music I love, Black American music. The last 100 years what what could go wrong <laughs> <laughs> so is that the first time you met bucky yeah as a matter of fact on the the very first night we were my wife and i we i guess we took the subway so we must have got off at young and Bloor, and we're walking down young street oh yeah and we went off onto a side street it was parallel to Young Street, so we could smoke a joint. And we come down to this cross street that's leading to Young Street, and we see this guy. The fuck! Look at this fucking guy. And this guy's in a three-piece white suit, white fedora. He's carrying a little briefcase. The guy looks like a fucking coke dealer. 
Absolutely. I say, look at that guy. God, if he's not a coke dealer, I'll eat my hat. We go into the club. Well, then coke dealer was Bucky playing the drums and in the case was microphones. <laughs> so that was the first time I saw Bucky. And we didn't meet that night. We didn't meet. Uh, I didn't meet him till he came to pick me up to go to the first gig. And so that was great, great, great. Now, the funny story about that is after I left David Wilcox, uh, a few years before that, Rough Trade used to play Saturday afternoon at the Colonial Tavern. And their bass player was a famous guy from Rhinoceros named Peter Hudson. Really great bass player. But he had a part-time job at Babel Law Radio, high-end. Right. So their gig was Saturday afternoon, and his boss wouldn't let him take the time off. So... In this era, there was very little subbing, except maybe in the jazz world. It didn't happen. But the piano player in Rough Trade was the girl who was the piano player in the Bob McBride band. So she goes, hey, I know this bass player. So they called me up. Can you come and... So I did two. After two, they said, will you join Rough Trade? I go, well, I'm kind of tied up because I'm in David Wilcox's band. And when you were in a band, you were working six nights a week, so you had a full-time job. And in those days, people didn't move around as freely. So I didn't even think anything about it. And no loss, I'm playing with David Wilcox. <laughs> Give me a break. So then I left David, and I'm sitting in my house. Six months before that, Rough Trade had broken up because they'd done a theater show with divine do you know who divine is yeah yeah drag queen called restless underwear and they did it at massey hall and it was a big production and it was pretty successful but the players in the band got peanuts out of what was a big successful show so they revolted and they all quit that left kevin staples and carol pope the principals the people who wrote they are rough trade those two Mm -hmm. so they didn't have a band for six months never you never saw them anywhere right so it's a saturday morning uh, sunday morning and i'm reading the newspaper and i see maple leaf gardens in six weeks time from phoenix arizona the tubes do you remember them yeah opening act rough trade I say wow i didn't even know they had a band do not ask me why, what I thought I was doing when I did it. But I immediately picked up the phone and I called Carol Pope. I said, hey, Carol, I see you playing in the gardens see, in six weeks. She says, yeah. I said, you got a bass player? She says, no. I said, I'm available. She said, you're hired. <laughs> I said, you got a drummer? She goes, no. I said, I've been playing with this guy named Bucky Burger. He's really cool. She said, bring him along. That's how I got in Rough Trade. Okay, so what is it about you, even though you said you didn't feel like you were really good until you were 40, or you were very comfortable with yourself until you were 40? No, I wasn't. But, but it seems like throughout your career, when you decided that you would become a professional musician, these opportunities happened and you were able to take advantage of those situations yes because the idea that you've actually played with big sugar rough trade lighthouse david wilcox i mean that's a pretty impressive list right there and that's probably only a small portion of the people you've played with so what is it what do you think it is about you that has afforded you those opportunities maybe lucky right place at the right time i don't know I'm not really a very good hustler. I've never been a hustler. Oh, it does, sounds like you didn't have to hustle, though. Like the opportunities always seem to open up to you. I guess, yeah. And that's why I said lucky. You know? Yeah. I, and I, 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 you know, having done a number of interviews 
and especially with this podcast, I've I've kind of wonder I kind of wonder about that concept of luck. I mean, I hear amazing stories about opportunities that happen yes. in the right place Planning at the right points. time. Yeah, but but I don't know if it's luck because you got to be good. You know, these things I don't must happen. Say, you know what? I was dedicated. Well, I had people in my past tell me I was too obsessed with music, that it was a fault. I think my by my nature, I was pretty dedicated straight away. And I don't think my dedication has waned in any way since. As a matter of fact, I think it has increased exponentially. Other than the pandemic, which was difficult for all musicians. Really, really. My first break in 53 years. Was there any other time that you doubted yourself as a musician? Did you think ever think? Yeah, oh, my... every day. But I listen to you and you talk about gigs, even what you went to yesterday, and, and how you feel about music and how passionate you are about playing. And, and not only about playing, but playing with these great people who, who might be young and inspiring. I mean, I, yeah. can, I can hear that when you talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Did that ever disappear? Did you ever think, oh, maybe I shouldn't do music, I should do something else? No. But uh, uh, there was somebody who suggested I should get out of music because they, they, were, a fr they were a friend. But I don't think they took me seriously as a musician. A little surprising for me, but whatever. It's such a, it's so abstract, you know, what, what is good? I was just having this conversation with somebody yesterday where we were saying, sometimes I hear a guy and they're really incredible. And I go, yeah, too good. Too good is annoying because usually it means they're taking up too much space. Which means they're not thinking ensemble. You don't have to be very good to be very good, is one of my mottos. You don't have to be a spectacular player. But if you're with like minded people and you surrender egos to the ensemble and to the purpose and to the song and to the melody and to the feel and to the moment, Ordinary people can make extraordinary music. When did you realize that? Let me think about that. Okay. Well, it comes in stages. Full fruition, weirdly enough, happened with Carol Pope in Rough Trade, which was when I realized that... Well, you know... It's it's so weird. When you think about it, musicians and listening, oh yeah, obviously, musicians listen, right? But there's listening and there's listening. And it takes a very long time for musicians to learn to have the ability to hear everything at once. And until you can hear everything at once, you'll always be slightly out of step because you're kind of oblivious. Now, oblivion comes in sometimes tiny, tiny increments, but it's amazing how micro things can still resonate strongly. And then it's sort of like, and something clicks into place, right? The weird thing is, the beginning of that for me was very early in the piece when I was playing in Sydney on that Taylor Square and I was playing with that Starving Wild Dogs band and I was doing my best to get by. But at one point, for the first time, I realised, oh shit, this is what they mean when they say, the groove 
It was as though I had surrendered to an outside force. And all I had to do was not take my eye off the ball and everything would be good. But the weird thing is, as I'm doing this completely new experience, which turned out to be the beginning of my consciousness, I realized, oh yeah, I remember this when I was 14 years of age and I was a long distance runner where you found your pocket and you stayed in that tempo and it allowed you to go and go and go and go and go. So that's also where my music started, even though it wasn't music. It was an experience I had as an athlete that is apropos to one of the mainstays of what it is to be a musician. Wow. Um, where does the Uncle Bass come from? The nickname comes from uh, 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 Alec Fraser and Leo Valvasori. I think Alec actually came up with it. And they love me. I love them. They're fantastic players. We have a lot of respect for each other. The way I play, I use fat strings and a high action. And most players don't like playing either my electric bass or my upright bass because it's just too fucking hard. But I've learned that to create the force I need to do the music I like, if it's easy, I can't do it. I played a bass last night. I played Leo's bass. He sounds fantastic. A 1957 uh, Fender Precision. But for me, the strings were just a little too thin and they were just a little too close to the fingerboard. And I just couldn't dig in like I do. When I dug in, I overwhelmed the instrument. I need, you know, so, oh shit, now I've sidelined myself here. Where, where will we be going with that? <laughs> Uncle Bass. <laughs> so, when they jokingly called me that for a couple of years, then there was a very abrupt, sad, abrupt ending to the Sinner's Choir. And this is your band. Well, that was a, a democracy, that man. And one of the players became disgruntled. And there was, in a situation like that, there's no like, oh, let's get somebody else to, you know. We did a thing, we had a sound, and we really had a sound. That was, I, I think that band should have been way more successful. And we were beginning to get there. But... The powers that be in Toronto, the gatekeepers, somehow never really gave us serious attention. However, our relationship with the audience was fiercely strong. People adored our band. Lots of musicians adored that band. We were now starting to play out in like London and that, and people are going, who the fuck are you guys? But... Disgruntlement is the end because it's the vibe killer. And no sin. So we had been playing five years in a row at Saturday noon till three at the Rex. Most successful run they ever had of a band playing noon till three. It was very, very good. So, I mean, hey, we actually did well out of it. We made good money. And I'm thinking, shit, I got to keep making money. And so when the band broke up, Alec Fraser calls me up. He says, hey, hey, you know, Alec, that's what you should do. He goes, you should start a band called Uncle Bass. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's funny. And then I thought about it. And I, it's just like in minutes, I went, yes, Uncle Bates, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rescue that spot from the wrecks. 
that belong to Sin Squire. I'm going to take, I'm going to go claim that. I'm going to go in there as Uncle Bass. And every week, I'm going to have different people in the band. And we were just going into our second year. And they were fantastic shows. So there would usually, I would pick people who were players and singers. So drummers who sang, a guitar player. Sometimes there were four people. A lot of times there were three people. And we would just go, okay, we need uh, eight songs a piece. We'll do it in what they call round robin, which is work like a charm. It was interesting. I got to hear my songs because I was still doing my originals and saying, here, this is how it goes. And it was very interesting to hear my songs being played every week by different people. And uh, that got scuttled by COVID. And then January of this year, I had a my thyroid removed. I was hyperactive. I had a hyperthyroidism. And my throat was dangerously swollen. And it was eventually going to lead to not being able to breathe or swallow food. So I had it removed. In the process, they damaged my vocal cords. I cannot sing Happy Birthday. So the prospect of me making another project, I can't face. Because if I can't sing, I don't want to do it. Because all my projects involved harmony vocals, which I love. Especially big three trio style. You know what that is? Mm -hmm. Willie Dixon, those guys. The blue harmony, where they're singing three part, but it sounds sort of like Duke Ellington's uh, horn section. And so now I'm just a side man until I die. And that's okay. I love, I love that. I can't sing. I'm sad. But I sang from five to 75, and at least I get to play the bass. And I do love playing the bass. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but, but I, I, you know, as I said, I still hear the passion that you have for music. I do, absolutely. And maybe more than ever, you know, because I know, I mean, I'm 75. How much longer do I have to play? So I value every fucking note. And I'll play till they tell me to stop. And honestly, I mean, I had cancer this year and now I don't. So I had a thyroid operation, lost my voice, had cancer, got fixed. And uh, I'm good now. I'm glad so to hear that. I'm just going to, you know, as I said, I don't really hustle. But I'm keen to... I'll, I'll do work if people want me to. Well, they obviously do. Terry, well, thank- you know, I'm not as busy as people think I probably am. And there were times when, you know, I worked 58 consecutive days. But, but I don't even want to do that anymore because, I mean, I wouldn't call myself semi-retired, but how hard do you think I want to push at my age? Even though every gig I full tilt hundred percent all the way, but just maybe not quite as often. So, Terry, um, my final question to you, and thank you so much for giving me all this time. But my final question to you is: I want to address the question that I asked before, which we kind of deviated from. But about you being a mentor, tell me about the reputation you have of being a mentor. Uh, it accidentally accumulated over many years. And I, I think that the first time it ever really happened was in David Wilcox and the Teddy Bears. Interestingly, David was two years younger than me, but he was a major mentor in my life, but that's a whole other story. So in the first edition of David Wilcox and the Teddy Bears that I was in, it was me and Bucky Berger and David Baxter. And then something went down and David Baxter was out and 16-year-old Colin Linden came in. He'd never played an electric guitar. He'd never really played with a rock band. He was pretty green. 
And in fact, Bucky and I revolted and said we went back to back. <laughs> so we actually got Colin Linden bunked out of David Wilcox and Teddy Bears. And you'd think that Colin and I would be sworn enemies for life. However, very shortly after that, I started working with Colin when he was very young, like 17. And I helped him produce some music early in the piece and we played together a bunch. And I don't know if he thinks of me as a mentor, but I, in my, if I ever think about the, the line of mentoring, I would have to say that was the beginning of it. What do you get out of mentoring people? Um, I think it's, I personally think that's what all older musicians should be doing all the time. But Michael Johnson at the Communist Order, when he introduces me, sometimes he will talk about my history to the audience. And... He said something recently on this topic where he said some people, a lot of older musicians are gatekeepers. Do you know what that means? Mm -hmm, I do. They want to keep people out. They don't want to help anyone. They don't want to have, they don't want to be threatened by up and coming talent. They, do you know what I mean? So yeah. they control their ter turf and you ain't getting on it. But, I am the opposite of that. So I, as people have been for me, and as people who I admire a lot have been, which is, I guess, generous with their sharing. Right, well said. Terry, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate you taking the time. Okay. Thank it's my you. pleasure. It was actually fun. I was a little bit surprised. I I didn't think I had that much, but there you go. No, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you.